Hello there, Professor Hildebrandt. Um, this is going to be the first part of a two-part lecture from Chapter 13 on correlations and linear regression. Um, and then I'll also do one or two more videos where I work out additional problems from our textbook. So in our previous chapters, um, we've been, you know, making estimations of our population based on samples. Um, but when we've been, all the work we've been doing so far, we were either looking at one interval level variable or one ratio level variable. So the biggest difference in this chapter is now we're actually going to be studying the relationships between two variables. So we'll either have two interval level uh, variables or two ratio level variables. And we're going to try to develop some numerical measures to express that relationship between them. Um, we'll also develop an equation. Um, that helps express that relationship and it's going to tell us things like is the relationship weak or is it strong? Um, is it direct meaning there's a positive relationship uh, as the independent variable goes up so does the dependent or is it an inverse relationship where as the independent variable goes up the dependent would go down so they move in opposite directions. Um, so here we go. So first what is correlation analysis? So this is just a group of techniques that we use to measure this relationship that I've been talking about um, between our two variables. We will first look at some graphing techniques, a scatter plot, we've actually looked at that before. Um, but then we'll also develop some more advanced numerical measures. But uh, for this chapter, we get to be asking questions such as, does the amount that health tech spends per month on training at Salesforce affect monthly sales? Right, and so their companies are looking to justify that expense perhaps, right? Is it worth it? Is there enough value in having these trainings? Um, and it would depend on the impact potentially to monthly sales. Or another question might be, um, this is important for you guys, does the number of hours that student study for an exam influence their exam score? Obviously we probably have a lot of research that says it does, and so that's why um, our students that want to score higher grades tend to spend more time studying. So first for that graphing technique, um, again, this is called a scatter diagram or a scatter plot. And it's just a graphic tool that we have to portray the relationship between two variables. And it was introduced in an earlier chapter. Um, important thing here, the independent variable is going to be on your x-axis and then the dependent variable will be on the y-axis. So here's our example. We're going to stick with this example um, throughout this chapter. So we have a sales manager and they want to know if there's a relationship between the number of sales called made in a month and the number of copiers that the sales force actually sells. And so they're going to begin their analysis with a random sample of 15 sales representatives from their entire company's population. And so with this data, the number of cells called, that would be the independent variable, the number of calls, and then the number of copiers sold would be our dependent variable. And here in this chart, you can see this uh, random sample of 15, the number of calls that they made, and then in this third column here, the number of copies they sold. So we're going to take this data from the chart and we're going to produce our scatter diagram. And I'm not going to read through all this for you. But as an example, our first salesperson, Brian, he made 96 calls and he sold 41 copiers. And so we would go along to the horizontal axis to X equals 96, so right about here, and then vertically go up to Y equals 41. And that green dot right there represents the data for Brian. And so you would do this for each um, individual in our sample. And you can tell by looking at the numbers, it's not a perfect positive relationship because these, these dots wouldn't all lie on the same um, straight line, but they are trending in a positive direction. Um, and so it seems reasonable just based on this uh, scatter diagram for the manager to tell the sales force that the more sales calls they make, the more copiers they can expect to sell. Um, and that would be important to your employees uh, if they were working on commission, right? Where at least a portion of their pay is based on the number of copiers they sell. Um, it's really important to note in this chapter though, when we're talking about this type of analysis, uh, 
that while looking at this, it does seem, there does seem to be this positive relationship between our two variables. Um, again, all the points would not fall on the line. Okay, and we'll talk about what that looks like in one second. So the next uh, learning objective from this chapter we're going to cover is called the correlation coefficient. And this is a measure of the strength of that linear relationship between our two variables. We identify it as R. So if you hear talk about the R, they're talking about the correlation coefficient for the variables. And again, it's going to show both the direction of the relationship, so positive or negative inverse, um, and also the strength of the linear relationship between our two either interval level or ratio scale variables. Um, your R can range from negative 1.0 up to positive 1.0. It's important to note that if your R is zero, then there is no association um, between those two variables. If the R is close to one, then that indicates a direct or positive correlation between the variables. Um, and if the value is near minus one, then that indicates a negative correlation. Um, And the closer the numbers are to zero, whether positive or negative, then the weaker the relationship is. So the closer they are to minus one or plus one, the stronger the relationship, and the closer they are to zero, um, the weaker the relationship. There are two examples of what we call perfect correlations. So in this first graph here, when you have an R of negative one, then that would be a perfect negative correlation. You can see that all of our data that we've plotted is on the same linear graph and this line would have a negative slope. However, if our R is plus one, so a positive one, then that we call that a perfect positive correlation. Once again, all of our data plots are on one linear line, um, but this line this time has a positive slope. So this first chart here um, is going to show more about the strength of the relationships and then the bottoms a little bit more about the direction. So again, perfect negative is minus one, perfect positive is plus one, and if we have an R of zero, then there is no correlation found between our variables. Now looking at the negative correlation side, so values between zero and minus one, again, the closer we are to minus one, the stronger that negative correlation. Um, and the closer we are to zero, it would be a weak negative correlation. Same thing on the positive side. If we're just slightly greater than zero, weak positive. If we get closer to one, a strong positive correlation between our variables. Um, now if we look at the second um, set of charts here on the bottom of the slide, if you look at this first one, I mean our data points are just really all over the place and so this one indicates that there's simply no correlation between the number of children as an independent variable and income level as the dependent variable. For the second graph, um, this middle one here, we see a slightly negative correlation between price and quantity. Um, if we were to plot a line in the middle of all of these points, it would have a negative slope, okay? And then the third one here on the right side shows a strong positive relationship between the hours studied as our independent and the exam score as the dependent variable here. Again, if I were to draw a line through the middle of these points, um, it would have a positive slope and, and it, our R, if we calculated it, would be pretty close to one. So how do we determine this correlation coefficient that we've been calling R? So let's go back to our example for the copier cells. Um, and first we're going to start with just drawing out that scatter diagram. But this time you can see we have divided 
our graph here into what are called quadrants. So we have four quadrants. Um, and these were not just arbitrarily drawn. The vertical line here is the mean of all the X values, which was uh, the mean here was 96. So you can see the sample mean for X is 96. And then the horizontal line here was the mean of our Y values uh, copy or sold. And the mean of the sample for Y was 45. Um, and so if the two variables are positively related and the number of copies sold is above the mean and the number of sales calls is above the mean, then those points are up here in this far top right corner, which we call quadrant run one. Um, if, however, the number of sales calls is less than the mean and the number of copy or sold is also less than the mean, then those points are down here um, in quadrant three, closer to the origin. All right, so let's keep going here, but then how are we going to determine what R would be? Um, well, this is our new formula. So here's your first formula for chapter 13. And to find R, we're going to sum up the difference from all of our values in our sample, subtracting the mean. We'll do that for both our um, X variables, so the sales calls, and then again for the Y variables, copy or sold. We're going to divide that then by our sample size n minus 1 times the product of the standard deviation um, of both the sample of x and the standard deviation sample for our y values. Um, and the book talks about it. Basically, they just go into Excel and calculate these. Um, at least for the purposes of this chapter, I will, on your homework assignment, provide you with those sample standard deviations because that's a lot to calculate if you're trying to do it by hand. Um, but again, if you reference in the textbook, there is a link that then takes you to a tutorial where they show you how to calculate your sample standard deviations in Excel. All right. So if you look at this chart of information here, um, this really isn't a lot different from some of the calculations we've done in earlier chapters. It's just that now we're analyzing two variables simultaneously. Um, so we have the, the second column here is the X column, the number of sales calls, and then the next column is Y. And so for this fourth column, X minus X bar, remember X bar is the sample mean. So all you're doing here is you're taking um, your value for X for the first row, it's 96, um, and you're subtracting out that uh, sample mean that we talked about in the previous slide. And you're going to go down and do that for each of your X values. Um, and then you'll do the same thing for Y. And then your final column here in the chart is the product of those two. So 0 times minus 4 is 0 negative 56 times negative 4 is a positive 224. Um, once all of those are done, we sum those up and we would get 6,672. So that's what's plugged into our numerator here in formula 13.1. Um, and then again, you would need those standard deviations. You could get those in Excel or I will give them to you. So you can see here it's 42.76 for X and for Y it's 12.89. We work out this math and we end up with an R here of 0 0.865, which indicates a very strong positive relationship. Now, it's really important to note that while the R coefficient indicates a strong positive relationship between our two variables, it does not demonstrate cause and effect. So we can't comprehensively prove that making more calls will lead to more sales. Um, it's not proven cause and effect. We are, all we're doing is showing that these two variables have a strong positive relationship. So they're statistically related. So that is important to know when you're doing correlation analysis.
So here's another example um, of determining a correlation coefficient. And this one is actually taking us all the way back to the beginning of the textbook when we had a lot of that data on Applewood Auto Group's um, auto sales. And so here their marketing department. So they seem to think that younger buyers tend to purchase vehicles where there is a smaller profit margin. Um, and then older buyers tend to purchase vehicles where there's higher profits for the company. And so if that's true, they want to use this information as part of an upcoming advertising campaign to try to attract those older buyers because that's where they're going to be making a larger profit. Um, so first we have uh, a scatter plot of profit versus age. Um, and just by looking at this, you know, this diagram does suggest that there's a positive relationship between age and profit. Um, it doesn't appear to be a strong relationship. There are a lot of outliers, but we would say it's definitely slightly positive. Um, so next we're gonna go through and we're gonna calculate R. So we're gonna use that formula 13-1 and we'll have to use Excel once again to find our standard deviations for the two samples. And once we do that, we would find that our value of R is 0.262. So yes, the relationship is positive, like the scatter diagram indicated, but we would say that it's relatively weak because it's closer to zero than it is to our positive one. Um, and so based on this, the data would not support a business decision to create an advertising campaign just focused on those older buyers. So the next topic in the chapter is testing the significance of our correlation coefficient, the R. Um, so let's go back to that copier example. Recall that the sales manager found the R of the sample to be 0 0.865. And so we said there was a strong positive relationship um, between those two variables of the number of calls made and the number of copiers sold. But now we have to ask the question, could that result be due to a sampling error? Um, how representative is this sample size of 15 to the company's overall sales population? Um, remember in this example, only those 15 people, um, only their data sales points were used. Um, so we could even ask the question more specifically, could there be zero correlation in the population from which this sample was selected? Um, so here we go. We're going to have our second formula down here. It's called the t-test for the correlation coefficient. It's formula 13-2 in the textbook. And we're going to let um, this symbol down here, we call this rho. R-H-O is how we pre um, pronounce this. So this is not a P. Um, when you see this, this is representative of rho. And this is where, uh, this is going to represent the correlation in the population um, and we're going to conduct a hypothesis test. So we're going back to um, the material that we covered in chapter 10 now um, to conduct a hypothesis test uh, to see if this population's correlation, rho, is different from zero. And so, um, again, this is the formula we'll use. T equals R times the square root of our sample size minus 2 divided by the square root of 1 minus r squared. And we're going to be using n minus 2 for our degrees of freedom um, with this t statistic. So remember, we have our six-step process that we covered in Chapter 10. And our first step is to state the null and the alternate hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is that rho equals 0. So the correlation in the population is 0. And so if we... Um, fail to reject the null, then what that means is that the R we found through that sample is not representative, right? Um, because it was showing a strong positive relationship. Um, our alternate hypothesis here is that rho does not equal zero. So it's some value other than zero. Um, and this would mean the correlation in the population is different from zero. This is a two-tailed test, right? When we have a null hypothesis equals a value and the alternate is that it doesn't equal that value, then that's when we have to use, so that's when we have to use a two-tailed test. Why? 
Remember here what question we're asking. We are specifically asking, could there be zero correlation in the population from which the sample was selected? And if you go back to when I introduced what our correlation coefficient characteristics are, we said that if R equals zero, then there is no correlation between those variables. So we want to see, um, is that the case here? So once again, we're going to use Appendix B5 with the degrees of freedom, this time of N minus 2. And so our sample size was 15. 15 minus 2 is 13. So 13 is the degrees of freedom that we're going to use. Um, we're told to use a level of significance in Step 2 of 0 0.05. And then we'll go to that Appendix B5 chart to find the T that we're going to use. Um, and if you did that, you would find the value is 2.160. So step four, our decision rule, we're going to reject the null hypothesis if T is less than 2.160 or if T is greater than 2.160. So you can see here we have our distribution graph and the rejection region are these two tails um, with values uh, in those tails. Um, now we're going to use this new formula, this formula 13.2. Um, so we plug in our R, we plug in our sample size, and we come up with a value of 6.216, which is going to be uh, in the, up in this positive reg uh, region of rejection here. Um, and so we're going to reject the null hypothesis. There is correlation with respect to the number of sales calls made and the number of copiers sold in this population of salespeople. And so that would be the, the step six, our final interpretation. So one more example of this, and this is gonna round out the first half of chapter 13. Um, going back to our Apple Auto Wood group, where we had an R of 0 0.262, which again says, okay, there's a positive relationship but it's a rather weak um, relationship as indicated by the R we got from the sample. Um, and so maybe we want to test our conclusion by conducting a hypothesis test, but this time we want to know if the correlation is greater than zero. And so in this case, we're going to have a one-tailed test this time. Why? Because here our question this time is whether or not the correlation is greater than zero. So our null hypothesis is that rho is less than or equal to zero. And so this would mean, if we fail to reject the null, that the correlation in our population is either negative or zero. Or, if we go with our alternate hypothesis, then rho is greater than zero, the correlation in the population is positive. Remember, and that's what our R had said, weak, but it is positive at an R of 0.262. Again, we're gonna use a level of significance of 0.05, we're going to use our T statistic to do this. Um, and so we once again will be going to Appendix B5. Um, our sample here was 180. So to get to the degrees of freedom, it's 180 minus 2 or, or 178. Um, but you'll notice uh, when you look at that appendix in B5, there isn't a 178. So we're just going to use 180. And the critical value for that is 1.653. So our decision rule then is to reject the null hypothesis if our T is greater than 1.653. So now once again, we're going to use formula 13.2 and we get a T value of 3.622. So our decision here is to reject the null hypothesis um, because our T value is greater than zero. Um, and so we conclude that there is correlation with respect to profits and the age of the buyer. Um, it's just... So because of this, because um, we are rejecting the null hypothesis, there's definitely some correlation here. Um, we still don't have a strong indication of what the outcome would be of a marketing campaign directed to our older buyers. Um, Cause again, that R was rather low, 
but there's definitely a positive uh, indications of a positive relationship between the variables. Okay, that's it for part one of chapter 13, and I will have another video up soon um, of the second half of this chapter.